You guys can currently see the screen there, Patrick. Yes. Welcome to everyone who's uh, joining the call there. Uh, we're going to give it a few more minutes, as Yannicka notes there, um, just to let more people get online, and then we'll get going with the, the panel. So good to have you here, and we'll talk soon. Feels like we should almost have some uh, background music playing as we wait for people to enter there. Doesn't that sound good, guys? Anybody come with music? I did that a while back using my Bluetooth speaker and had some tafel music on our tafel music, but I'm not sure exactly how that sounded, but should have thought about that today. <laughs> Next time. There's probably some ITS specific music, no? Uh, yeah. I have... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. We're just going to give it just a few more moments to uh, get, allow people to get in. Obviously, these days we're often not having to run from one meeting to another. We just switch screens, but that means uh, things get quite packed. So, you know, I appreciate you all joining us today for this, uh, I think, you know, really important conversation. It's great to have 
uh, these various individuals here with me today. Um, and Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Janneke and I'm the Managing Director of ITS Canada. And on behalf of the Secretariat and the Board of Directors, we welcome all of you. ITS Canada, we are the hub for mobility technologies. Mobility technologies enable the safe, efficient and reliable movement of goods and people. The hub is the place where the needs of the Canadian transportation system connect with the ideas, technologies, and capabilities of our members. ITS Canada is the hub where challenges meet solutions. Diversity, inclusion, and equality for all are ingrained in the DNA of ITS Canada. Together, we promote, encourage, and create a culture which supports and celebrates diverse voices of our members. We embrace our differences in race, ethnicity, gender, and sexual orientation. When we say we are the hub for mobility technologies, we mean the hub for everyone. We support mobility technologies through championing the benefits, fostering and promoting innovation, integrating the expertise, products and services of our members, enabling communication for learning and collaboration. To learn more about ITS Canada's recently published strategic plan, please visit the ITS Canada website. And so with no further ado, May I introduce you today's moderator, Jonathan Ford, Chair of ITS Canada's ATMS Technical Committee. Jonathan. Great. Well, good morning, everyone, and or good afternoon, depending on what area of uh, Canada you're currently situated in. Welcome to uh, ITS Canada's virtual panel. Um, as Yannicka said, my name is Jonathan, and I'm with KPMG's Global Infrastructure Advisory Team here in Canada, where I get to work. Um, and have the opportunity to help cities and organizations better use connectivity, technology, and data, along with other organization enabling work that ultimately enable us to make better decisions, which improve service delivery and the lives of the people around us. And a key area where that is happening is in transportation. So as Yannicka said, you know, I'm privileged to be the chair of the ATMS Technical Committee, the Advanced Traffic Management Systems Technical Committee along with my City of Calgary colleague, Samir Patel, who you can see sitting in the boardroom there, um, and who you'll hear about more shortly. Um, so let's keep on moving into it. Get my slide here to move forward. So today's webinar is brought to you by the uh, Advanced Traffic Management Systems Technical Committee. Uh, however, you know, just for your own interest, there are another five in total there that you can participate in. Lots of good activity going on uh, in those areas and always open for more people to participate. And the Advanced Traffic Management System, our technical, technical committee, has been created to share uh, best practices and technical information, uh, promote the deployment of intelligent transportation systems, encourage those open interfaces and standards, and explore innovative systems and deployments to increase the efficiency and improve productivity of traffic and all those things related to it. And so if you want to be, become a uh, member and you know participate with us, you know committee members have an opportunity to be actively involved in priority setting and steering of you know ITS's uh, Canada's uh, activities within this area. So you know transportation management providers, private sector representatives interested in learning more about or sharing information on related technologies and industry trends, or playing a role in you know, related policy advocacy, you know, you're encouraged to contact Yannicka or you know, one of the committee chairs, so myself or Samir, if you'd like uh, to find out more information. And you can see the ITS Canada website in the bottom screen. All right, so in terms of the format of today's session, uh, after introducing our awesome speakers that we have on today. Um, each one will have some time to provide some context and some initial insights on this topic of traffic management and COVID during these timeframes. 
Um, and then we'll go into some more formal panel questions. And then should questions come to mind, uh, feel free to submit questions throughout the presentation um, using the question panel um, and, or the chat window. And we'll look to answer those as, as many as we can in the open Q&A. So without any further commentary for myself, let's introduce our panelists. You can see them on the screen here. Uh, so Patrick Ricci is an engineer who completed his studies in automated production management back in 2003 and is currently in the process of obtaining his MBA. So keep him busy on all sides of the, uh... oh, saying that they can't see my screen here. Sorry, just give me one sec. Can you now see my yeah. screen? Yeah. Yes. Apologies for that. So just to head back just a slide or two. If you need to get a hold of us, you need to talk to Yannicka, see our information, please feel free to do that right there. And there's the agenda. All right, Patrick. So currently working on getting his MBA, uh, but he had experience you know, in manufacturing companies such as Bombardier Aerospace, Novabus, and Alstrom Transport. And that's where he required a, a lot of his experience in the field of transportation and integrating ITS technologies together. Um, Patrick has a lot of good ex expertise, both technically and in project management, and, you know, has volunteered in sharing, you know, that with, you know, younger generations in terms of the junior achievement program, where, you know, they're building businesses and companies themselves, which was, you know, that student was nominated as company of the year, so great stuff. Uh, he joined the division of the operations um, and arterial network of the city of Montreal with the mandate to integrate an advanced traffic management system. And he subsequently took on the main responsibility for the development and implementation of the Urban Mobility Management Center, the CGMU. Obviously the acronyms don't align because it's obviously en français, but my daughters would probably correct me a lot if I actually tried um, to speak in French. So I, I'll save you that trouble with the city of Montreal. And it's been since 2016 that Patrick has taken on the role of team leader for the CGMU operations. And this includes a traffic management center, lighting management, traffic uh, camera monitoring, counting and detection technologies, as well as digital street signage system. Um, CGMU is also the emergency response center for essential infrastructure, such as the arterial network, bridges and tunnels, as well as the Montreal Electrical Commission. So lots going on, lots of excitement in that world. So great to have you, Patrick. Um, looking forward to your uh, conversation and the input that you have. I'll just move on to Samir here and through to Karim Majit, and then we'll pass it over to Patrick. So Samir has a master's degree in transportation engineering from the Illinois uh, Institute of Technology in Chicago. He has over 20 years of experience in transportation engineering, including ITS, signal coordination and optimization, uh, traffic incident and emergency management. So he's been working and doing a lot of good work and has designed and implemented various ITS systems. And currently he leads the Regional Traffic Management Center, the RTMC, uh, with Alberta Transportation. Uh, he's been with the City of Calgary for 14 years. And for the last nine years, he's been working as the leader of traffic management center for the city of Calgary. So Samir, wonderful to have you. Great to have your knowledge and expertise um, and insights today. And finally, but not least, we have Karim Jeet. Uh, Karim Jeet graduated from Punjab Technical University with a Bachelor of Technology in Civil Engineering back in 2002. And then in 2004, he finished his master's degree in transportation engineering and then came to Canada in 2006, began working for the uh, Ministry of British Columbia um, in 2008 as a traffic technician. Um, and through a lot of hard work and dedicated effort, you know, he's moved from being an EIT, engineer in training in 2009, all the way up to obtaining his PNG in 2012, and now works as the traffic operations engineer at that time in Coquitlam. Um, but is now, you know, from the last little while, moved on to become the manager of traffic operations and engineering for the BC Ministry of Transportation uh, and Infrastructure. 
And so he's a large representative on large projects such as the Portman Highway Number One project, uh, South Fraser Perimeter Road projects, Highway 17 and 91 interchanges, and many other items. So lots of wealth of experience here over the past little while, and I'm you know looking forward to this conversation with each of you. Um, hopefully, there's a lot of good information to share with with yourselves on what's currently happening within the traffic management world due to COVID. Um, you know, the things that they've experienced, the things that have been challenging, the opportunities they see moving forward. And, you know, maybe at the end, we'll get an opportunity to find out how we as a community can best support um, these leaders, as well as leaders on the phone that are dealing with traffic management as we move forward. So without any ado, let's get over to Patrick. I'm just going to share my other screen here. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, first, I would like thanks to thank uh, ITS Canada and the committee for inviting me. Uh, so I will start uh, to present the City of Montreal ATMS perspective uh, of the impact of the COVID-19 in everyday mobility. Next. So um, to put ourselves back in the context, uh, you know, in the province of Quebec, Quebec and March 13, we uh, the, the province uh, went to the uh, state health emergency, and after the war, and two weeks later, uh, the city of Montreal itself went to the, the state emergency. So um, it's been a while where everyone, everyone was confined in their house, a lot of uh, stores and mobility was impacted and reduced, and. On May 22nd, uh, the, the, the started to restart opening and gradually um, reopen the services, the shops, and every uh, the outside access. For next, sorry. For the ATMS perspective, perspective of the uh, the TMC. Um, on the March 13, uh, we had you know the, the there was one uh, one situation where uh, everyone had to you know stay home go back home and except for the essential services but from the uh, TMC um, situation uh, all these the, all the, uh, the, the installation uh, was shared between the operators so uh, it was hard to keep the distance and was also um, risky for themselves so we also decided to you know put everyone back to their home and do um telecommuting uh for the people to work from home so uh in 24 hours uh we were able to um install everyone to their home and after 48 hours everyone was ready up running and uh, all the, our services were uh, fully operational so uh i would say that uh, with the help because the, the operators were also um, Help a lot, and they shared their own equipment to be able to be able to uh, deploy very fast uh, the activities. And the only information, uh, or the only tools we could not transfer outside was uh, for sure the uh, the video wall and also the radio systems, which it's um, it's a physical, and it's not cannot be uh, places elsewhere. Other changes we had to you know adapt ourselves is. Um, uh, all, all, everything about the remote uh, tool so um, we were we were able to you know exploit the all the cloud-based tools that were available at the city of Montreal and to keep the contact between the operators since they're sitting next to each other we uh, actually created a virtual room where the people just connected and they had to they could speak like they were next to each other and for for different uh, update, we need to do some correction on the process uh, for it's just a minor details, but just closing this, the workstation and share it to someone else. We just have to manage, make sure that people they just don't shut down the computer since nobody will be there to put it back on. So it's minor details, but uh, it was we had to check that. And uh, for managing perspective, for sure. Uh, we have to rethink all the uh, presence, the engagement, and also you know, taking care of the people from their home. So in either physically or mentally, you know, make sure everyone is still okay because you know, they still live, live with the pandemic situation uh, uh, more than just work, you know? So next. So uh, everything has been deploying. We're ready to run at that moment. So um, 
from the outside uh, view for the, uh, more the management for the traffic mobility, um, the first issue we had to face is that uh, in May people started going outside and there were a lot more people going outside because uh, they just stopped using the, the vehicle. So uh, the sidewalk wasn't large enough to keep the, the, the two meters distancing uh, required by the government. So uh, we've quickly uh, installed some sanitary corridors to enlarge the, the sidewalks. And it just was uh, managed basically by the, the, the boroughs, the 19 boroughs of the city of Montreal. But you know, there were more and more people go, going outside. So we had to uh, also manage some uh, activities to increase or uh, restore. I could see the next slide if you want to, uh, Jonathan. To uh, give back, you know, the streets and, and reactivate, I would say, the economic uh, perspective for the for the stores and the, the, all the activity in the city. So, we did some major um, readjustment to keep it still keep it nice and um, and the, the, have the people, you know, to enjoy being outside and keeping the safe distance. Um, but you now more and more people are starting to go outside and and they were going to the park. So another issue came up is uh, is having you know how we can manage the people not going still keep the distance in the parks. So uh, we came to an, another uh, solution. Uh, Jonathan can go to next slide. Is uh, basically the active and safe line park because since the park wasn't enough, we added some extra line uh, streets. We call it the uh, VAS, which is in French for active and safe lines. And we added um, like 21 kilometers of, of bike, like, uh, bike lining and a lot more space for people to be able to walk in the streets and have enough space. Next. So um, you can see um, there were a lot of management. So around June 8th, 8th uh, all of the, the deployment was done. Um, it, it was a huge effort for the city because just to design and put you know, those streets on, on, to start the project, uh, normally it would, it would have taken uh, a lot of months to just to you know have everything ready and have the go to start. So we did it actually in uh, 11 days uh, to start doing the deploy. So which this was a, a, a record for the city. Um, and basically, um, like I said, there were like 21 kilometers and um, there were like a, a lot of um, maybe five axes that were put it on the streets. And right now in, in October, so, uh, since the winter is coming, uh, well, not for the, the, um, the, the snow plowing and everything. So we have to remove most of them. So we did the demonization in around three weeks. For uh, the um, next slide, for the the TMC's perspective, what we do for, to help to, to do the management of those you know, deployments and uh, surveillance. So we helped at the beginning to uh, do some surveys uh, on the street to see where the people you know goes and see what what's the interest of the, the people who want to walk. So we have we helped to do the service first and do some counting and, and be able to you know identify the type of the reaction of the people during the deployment we uh we were also uh, in help to um to for the, the contractor surveillance because there are a lot of the contractors outside they were but we still have to manage the mobility so we want to make sure that the deployment was still safe and in respect of the mobility and uh, after the, when everything was uh, on street, uh, we also, you know, tried to understand the, the, how the behavior of the citizens were going with those streets if they were reacting correctly, what we were intended to do. And for for uh, analytic at the end, we use uh, all the different ITS tools to be able to you know, count and analyze and get information. So if you go to the next slide, there's some data we managed to figure out out of it. So. If you see there, uh, you see that the, the green line are actually the extra uh, corridors we we added to uh, for the bike line. So we see that there was a lot of usage and uh, and, the, and very interesting information we got in the next slide. If we compare also the weekly and the weekend, so we see that there was a, a, a good increase in the usage on, on every, every lanes, uh, specifically in Barry, Ontario. So it's just on three of them, but see there's a, a big increase and for the pedestrian on the next slide 
we saw on all the access for the uh, managed for them uh, that uh, there are a lot of you weekly um, duties for, for the pedestrian. So we'll see the next side. So at the end, um, what we learned from it, it is that you know to be able to uh, deploy and exploit and, and, and be able to adapt ourselves with uh, the, the, the big change on, on, on the on the terrain network on the city of Montreal, uh, communication and coordination was you know a big factor that we still need to work on it because it's it's the core you know if we want to make it a success. Uh, what we already you know I, I could say we're proud and happy of it is that collaboration and uh, the, the technical adjustments from different stakeholders were very reactive and good uh, for the situation. And I would say maybe also that the, all the planning and uh, brand planning, uh, they were really agile for deploying those projects. Oh, I think the slide just changed. Oh, <laughs> and uh, finally, um, I would say that in long term, if we uh, after the, that pandemic, uh, what we could look in the future is uh, for sure all the telecom meeting. Uh, we need to look at more of a permanent perspective now that the cities uh, knows that it's feasible, uh, not just an emergency side, but an operation normal side also. And um, we need to rethink how we go on so you know human. Uh, the, uh, how we can manage the training and the care, caretaking of the people. This is going to be something we need to think about. And for the management center uh, perspective, um, there is some uh, reflection we have to do on, um, you know, having a physical installation uh, versus using a virtual installation, which is what we are right now. And we see this work. So, you know, we need maybe we do rethink and reconsider uh, the strategy on, on that side. And uh, for sure, for a long time, there were Everyone was thinking that centralized services uh, for uh, all the stakeholder would be a solution, but we also proved that decentralized services, if you're correct, uh, cor rightly connected, it's also really feasible and maybe even better if for the future if we have no other situation like this one. And for sure, uh, there will be a revolution um, of the operation practices, uh, that's for sure. So um, that's pretty much for me. Thank you very much. We are mute, Jonathan, I think. Great, so Mary, I'll pass you over the uh, controls there and uh, get you up on. Hope uh, everybody can see my screen here. Um, Looks great. Okay, perfect. So, uh, uh, thanks, Jonathan, and uh, thanks, I guess, Canada, to um, uh, uh, give us an opportunity to be a part of this uh, panel discussion uh, to share our experience with uh, COVID-19 and ATMS point of view. Uh, put together a few slides; won't be a lot, uh, just to give us, uh, you know, um, see what our uh, you know impact and those things. Um, just before we start, I just thought maybe give you guys uh, just a high level overview of uh, jurisdiction point of view or responsibility point of view. City of Calgary, it's a little different than uh, Toronto and Vancouver. We don't have any um, uh, adjacent municipality or, you know, which is in a good way. So from traffic management point of view, as you know, uh, uh, less uh, uh, because it's one entity. But only one thing is we have is... Uh, we share uh, jurisdiction with uh, Albert Transportation. The, our ring road, uh, you see, is uh, getting finished right now, which is uh, is owned by Albert Transportation. And uh, the Deer Foot Trail, which passes the middle of the middle of the Kiage, the one it shows on the green here. Um, so that is the only one uh, is uh, by province actually. The rest of the uh, all traffic management is done from City of Kiage. We are roughly 1.3 million population, as you might know. Um, traffic signal-wise, we are close to 1,100 traffic signal. Um, we have 24-7 TMC uh, traffic management center. Uh, I, I wrote about our TMC. It's a it's a great uh, partnership we are having last 12 years with Albert Transportation. What it does is uh, we manage. Uh, 
all the incident management or provide uh, TMC services to Alberta Transportation. Uh, it's a great synergy. So have not, they don't have to have their own TMC uh, in Calgary or within province. So that's the whole idea. So it's working great actually. So we'll talk sometime later more about that, but uh, just wanna give you a overview of what uh, we are kind of responsible and those things. Um, when COVID-19 hit like first in March, uh, end of or mid-March, and oh, we can say uh, we were, uh, uh, the biggest thing was, as you can imagine, as Patrick was saying, you know, uh, at the operation center, mostly sharing desk or shift hardware Another can be sharing desk can be a huge concern. Um, also, one of the things we found out, we had hired a few uh, staff and uh, training, remote training, that can be something was a new actually, uh, usually had been done in one on one. And uh, some of these systems, people may not used it outside uh, uh, these TMCs unless they worked in TMC side of uh, environment and those things also remote working and technology point of view. So we, it took us a few days, uh, two, three days to make sure uh, a few staff were working remotely. Uh, everything is uh, working fine from, uh, they are able to access the systems and uh, able to communicate with other groups and those things. Uh, but the good thing on the other side, uh, you'll see on the top, that's where our temporary TMC was there. Uh, last, you might have heard that uh, uh, we've been, Calgary has been working on our new TMC for last three years, which came really handy uh, during this time and which kind of forced us to move into quickly. Uh, so what we did was um, one of the thing as a strategy from uh, COVID impact to minimize on the staff, uh, finding that social distancing and those things. Uh, we've been running 40, 40, 20, which means is we're still running our temporary TMC. We are using our new TMC and uh, we are 20% staff is working remotely. Uh, so realizing this uh, in the whole COVID-19 scenario, our situation might last longer than we expected. Uh, luckily so far, we never had uh, any uh, case within our group or on the floor. Uh, so we don't have to go into quarantine. And uh, so in that way, we were lucky. Uh, but this did help uh, uh, minimize the impact, I would say. Uh, um, another thing, we always, as a TMC, we always work closely with our CIMA, which is uh, Calgary Emergency Management Agency, uh, during any emergencies. And uh, uh, this was not a different than that one. So we had all the procedures ready, but then uh, you can imagine most of the roads were deserted at the beginning, for sure. Uh, so. Uh, the, some of the DMS signs. Uh, we have also have this uh, 107.9 FM radio. Uh, it's a low frequency radio, which is Calgary has a very unique. Uh, so we've been using that those uh, uh, outlets to uh, get information out to the public. At the beginning, you can see on the right hand side, which is we don't do that right anymore. But uh, uh, at the beginning, getting those information out was very important. Uh, uh, from uh, making sure everybody uh, getting those uh, uh, information. Uh, a few uh, another things what we did uh, as uh, uh, from most of our downtown is uh, it doesn't have need a, a push button. It's a free time, uh, but outside downtown, but where majority of the pedestrian corridors where we what we did was we put a, a recall mode uh, close to 50, 60 uh, intersections. But also we had to put this sign you can see on the left hand side you know uh, some of those things you know uh, so people should not use the push button uh, to on the right hand side you'll see uh, um, uh, as uh, most of the roads were not utilized much uh, and uh, from social distancing point of view sidewalks and pathways were not enough so we multiple roads were converted into uh, pedestrian and bike way only lay, uh, roads uh, and they did help a lot. Also, we did uh, give temporary outdoor patio permits to a lot of businesses uh, on last minute, or you can say expedited way to um, get the businesses, uh, uh, recover some of the uh, money they have lost and those things. Uh, going back to the uh, some of the trends, uh, it did impact uh, uh, hugely 
on, uh, on of course the traffic as well as uh, different modes and you can say so what we started our uh, transportation data had created various uh, mobility trends uh, throughout calgary understanding how it is impacting and uh, those things so some of the examples here uh, you'll see this is the report uh, this was generated every month so we could see the trends or month over month uh, this you can see in during in March end or March 30th, some of the Glenmore Trail, which is one of the one of the biggest uh, uh, arterial in Calgary, was running 45% uh, of the uh, traffic volume wise, uh, and then it increased in September end. We were up to 97%. Uh, then again, as the COVID uh, uh, cases or numbers increase, and you can see people kind of gradually reducing their uh, trips. Uh, so again, it, you could see the reduction in the uh, volume again. Uh, but again, it goes by each quarter on one on the right hand side of the McKnight, which is highly used, which is uh, we are back to 92%. Um, on the left hand side, you can see some of the speeds, how it is impacting on these on these corridors. And uh, you could see nicely that uh, March 30th, where the, the red line is there, uh, there's hardly any I would say the speed wise, uh, there's a hardly any delays actually. Um, so if that's kind of the ideal situation, you can say that, right. Um, uh, they, we also created a bunch of trends, uh, understanding how our usage on transit. Uh, of course, uh, you can see that we are not anywhere close to the uh, usage we had in the beginning of the March. Uh, so uh, we are, I would say about 50% uh, on the uh, transit, transit and the uh, sea train and bus usage. Again, people might have uh, uh, changed uh, modes also. You can imagine that uh, uh, from sort of using transit, maybe they feel comfortable more using their car, uh, have uh, those kind of uh, uh, modal change may have happened over the time. Uh, and, uh, but uh, we are, coming back, I would say, usage-wise. Uh, we also had uh, uh, seen similar things from active moves, uh, but it was exactly the opposite compared to how it was for the vehicles. You can say during summertime, they speaked, and whereas they are, again, kind of trending down, uh, as you can say, from um, a pedestrian as well as bicycle point of view and those things as a we are rolling into the winter. Uh, I have another slide for, uh, uh, this is talks about our parking, uh, uh, parking in downtown and nearby areas. Uh, so you can see on the left uh, in the middle chart, which is uh, surface lot parking, which is utilized 56% uh, only. Uh, and uh, the street parking, uh, which is uh, 76%. Uh, but on the right hand side, uh, that uh, graph is pretty interesting to show that uh, how the overall trend is actually uh, looking from uh, compared to 2019 uh, to 2020. Uh, you could see like, uh, I would say around May, June time, uh, they were utilized 9%. Uh, so these are all our revenue, actually you can see, imagine uh, usage as well as because uh, again, cities are uh, these revenue uh, streams are, re are really important for um, uh, our budgets and those things. So definitely, I, 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 that's all I have for as a presentation point. Definitely, there will be more uh, items will be discussed uh, shortly. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Samir. And now I'll just pass it over here to myself just to bring up the screen there for Karim G. So Karim G. Hello, Hi. thank you very much, Jonathan and ITS Canada, giving me this opportunity to present like uh, uh, the impact of uh, BC highways. Uh, and um, next, please. So, BC Ministry of Transportation, the Ministry of Transportation plans transportation network provide transportation services and infrastructure develop and implement transportation policies and administrative 
many related acts, regulation, and federal provincial fund funding program. The ministry strive to uh, build and maintain a safe and reliable transportation system and provide affordable, efficient, and accessible transportation options for all British Columbians. Next, please. So, as you see, the map of Brit BC, and then a uh, we have very diverse population like uh, living in like a north uh, northern region southern interior region lower mainland district and vancouver island district uh lower mainland district cover uh, the south uh, west corner of bc and has over 50 percent population uh, provincial population next please so key covid 19 dates in bc March 11, um, WHO declared COVID as a pandemic. Uh, March 18th, BC declared state of emergency. March 21st, Canada US border restriction to essential travel only and personal service business shutdown that include uh, uh, gym, uh, barber shop, and uh, a restaurant for takeout only. Um, March 9, uh, May 19th, reopen begins and phase two of the pandemic response begins uh, june 24th phase three of uh, pandemic reopen begins in bc october 19 bc official announced second wave of covid 19 next please so when like in a uh, mid-march when uh, bc uh, declared a state of emergency and then our response for this uh, we start updating all our dms signs to, to show the covid messaging Message was most like uh, throughout the province on provincial highway, we were displaying COVID stay home, avoid gathering, essential travel only. And then also our maintenance contractor, they offered us uh, um, CMS signs. So we uh, use uh, the messaging on those portable DMS signs to give a message to public to stay home and uh, only essential travels. Next, please. So uh, next I would share like uh, what impact on uh, British Columbia highways, how much traffic volume change. So this is like the first slide is uh, in the Metro Vancouver. So all the bridge crossing, we, you can see like the blue line is 2019 traffic volume and then uh, red show 2020 traffic volume. So the fourth week of uh, March, you can see 47% drop from 2019. It's when like after, uh, we declared the state of emergency. And uh, you can see like uh, when we op reopened up on phase two you know, in May, the volume start uh, picking up. And then you can see it gradually picked up. And when we started like phase three, so volume picked more up, but uh, then uh, it's summertime, it remains uh, consistent and then we can see the still volume last week of october is eight eight percent drop from 2019 next please so this one is uh, uh, the traffic volume on highway one that highway one connect uh, uh, lower mainland with the rest of bc and uh, uh, rest of canada so you can see like the traffic volume was 37 percent dropped uh, during uh, first week of April, and then uh, in some time it start increased, and but uh, now we still see like four percent increase uh, from 2019 uh, volume. Next, please. So this is like uh, the we have like uh, over here in Lower Mainland four major water crossing. So the traffic volume you can see like when. Uh, uh, March 21st, uh, uh, border is closed and only restricted only to essential travel. So we can see like it's uh, the traffic volume dropped 69% uh, uh, and 76 and still we have 73%. Uh, this is until only May, but we still see like around 73 or 75% drop because border is still uh, restricted to essential travel. So the uh, rest is 25 or 30% traffic volume is only the truck traffic. Next. 
So this uh, graph present like a um, uh, volume between BC and Alberta border. You can see like the volume dropped uh, first week of April 37% and in summer time still it was low and start picked up in uh, the first uh, second week of September and then it again start dropping on like a fourth week of uh, October. So this this traffic volume is in like for interior like uh, we can see the first uh, week of April it was dropped 38 percent and gradually increased in like during summer time so like where when more driver go out for interior like a northern region uh, during summer time and then we can still see the traffic volume is a, a bit higher over there in the northern region higher than 2019 so we noticed that like the average speed for um, throughout the bc was increased but for on highway 1 85th percent uh, speed was increased three percent in april and still we are seeing the speed is higher than 2019. next please so also we see the trends for cyclists like you can see these graphs like uh, uh, work week ridership decreased by approximately 27% for two weeks after the state of emergency. This could be additional due to like uh, a weather, like in uh, last two week of March, weather was not, uh, it was rainy. And uh, in April, work weeks are large increase in ridership where um, could be uh, same like uh, due to weather like uh, or other like uh, we have seen more recreational uh, ridership for cyclists they, they they start riding yeah so we we could not see the clear trends next please So for uh, methodology for uh, traffic volume, volume data collected from uh, all regions of VC uh, ground detector loop used to collect data, uh, traffic radar also used, and then uh, we were weekly reports created to provide direct comparison of 2019, as you see in previous mal, uh, graphs. And there was a key, uh, key stakeholder, internal VC government. We were sending up weekly traffic update to our objective and uh, to minister and also like a bc center for controlled disease they were using our da data to uh, during the modeling and then seeing uh, how like uh, uh, align these one with the number of cases in bc and uh, translink and bc transit they were also entrusted in our data to look at how the trend and also insurance uh, corporation of uh, uh, BC, they were uh, the, our stakeholder to look at uh, and all the media outlet, they were reporting like uh, on which um, crossing or which region we are seeing the decrease in traffic volume. That concludes my presentation, but uh, in a panel discussion, we can see the lesson learned and opportunity how we can. Thank you. Perfect. Well, so, you know, as we heard so far you know there's been a change in our operations there's been a change in our transportation system right the route that people are using the construction the active transportation uh the restaurants and all those other things that we need to accommodate um as well as you know change in demand fluctuations change in travel modes and the other theme that you see is often you know data has been being pulled driving those insights to support new decisions within the transportation management centers, but also a larger increasing role across the organization. Um, so, you know, as you guys have moved through this item and, you know, spent, you know, your waking hours over the last eight to nine months to manage traffic during this, uh, you know, unprecedented sort of time, at least in the last, you know, 100 years, what are some key, you know, important takeaways or lessons that you've learned um, from an advanced traffic management um, systems perspective? Oh, just make sure you unmute yourself there. Patrick, you are on mute. Oh, you're still on mute there, Patrick. 
Let me see if I can help you. Well, maybe we'll uh, get Samir while we're waiting for Patrick to get it. Uh, just to, you know, one of the thing I, as Patrick kind of leaning towards, you know, one, one of the thing I could say is uh, how the change, you know, the traditional traffic management having a huge uh, monitor wall and having that uh, sure. situational awareness and those things. So I think those things we have to rethink, I guess, you know, as we see, you know, uh, if we, let's say, if I would have to expand, I mean, it just happened that we just built our new TMC here. Uh, but then let's say if I have to build new TMC, I would be putting that new hat and say, okay, how that, you know, remote, uh, you know, capability or uh, I'm that 100%. I, I mean, we did actually, it's not about that, but then what is the future actually? So, you know, think about from within our organization also, do we need to spend that kind of money also? But then how we technologically, we can say, yeah, if we need somebody, uh, let's say additional help from staff, we can do that on demand, I guess, and those things. Whereas that was kind of always considered to be in 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 the office and those things. So well, that's one thing. And of course, I'll let uh, Patrick uh, add more stuff. Can you hear me, hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, what, what I would say, what I learned is, um, I think the, word, the, the way of working from home, which is, wasn't a part of the culture for public uh, division, I think this is the biggest change uh, that we need to you know, uh, look at uh, because uh, we were lucky because the city of Montreal actually would just switch to uh, the suite, uh, Google suite, uh, uh, basic tools we use like Word and Office. So just having that already uh, helped a lot to you know be able to have everyone work from their home without having to you know move the whole equipment. So uh, I think this this the, the feature uh, the focus needs to be done you know on how the more and more we're going to be working from outside of the central. I think that would be uh, the biggest lesson and more strategic wise. I think uh, for sure. You need to have, you know, the emergency plan ready, uh, any, even for the pandemic, any for anything else. So if your plan is good, you can use it for any events in the future. So that's probably uh, what I learned mostly from that experience so far. Okay. Okay. And Jay? So like uh, the traffic uh, role and responsibility for traffic management, how we change like uh, we have one um, George Massey tunnel uh, where we run a counter flow lane uh, during the rush hour and uh, we were seeing the traffic volume was reduced uh, like around 60% and then for three months we didn't run uh, the uh, counter flow lane and uh, also uh, uh, like uh, at our uh, uh, transportation management center over there like uh, we looked at like uh, because the traffic volume was lower and we have seen the reduction in the incident too and we were running the covert messaging and then the traffic management center the staff was very quiet during that time but uh, uh, like for those two to three months but after when it uh, reopened it again start picked up and then uh, yeah and then also what we look like uh, because uh, the traffic volume was lower and then we gave some extra window for our uh, contractor uh, for construction and uh, like uh, extended their lane closer hour and then so they can complete their work. Also, we have like, uh, as uh, uh, Sami mentioned that like uh, they put the push button, like we had on some location, the old push buttons uh, where you can only push with the finger and then not with other body parts and then we, we uh, are in process of replacing or we already replaced some with the new push buttons. Gotcha. And a question from the uh, attendees. Does anyone track public inquiries, requests or complaints uh, between 2019 and 2020? You know, have the frequency changed of those sort of requests or the nature of those or questions that people are asking compared to what they're maybe dealing with and bringing to in the past? 
I I can tell you, I mean, definitely it went down, I would say. <laughs> uh, it's just because they are not out on the road and the, because most of our uh, inquiries come from more from traffic point of view, let's say traffic signal having not enough timing. Think about that. That's our top one, I guess, you know. Uh, it's uh, competing priorities, right? Like uh, it's just uh, not enough time, I guess, you know. Um, so those kind of definitely went out. I don't know how much percent I can get that number, but uh, definitely uh, that's a pretty uh, one of the thing uh, we get. Always uh, the rest one also went down for sure because let's say the potholes, right? People are not to drive, then definitely they're not gonna report those kind of thing. Uh, but definitely we there is a substantial drop, I would say. Uh, you can see some of the graphs. Uh, I mean, if they, those are free flow, right? So literally that can be like it's a west uh, or nightmare for the traffic engineer that's kind of if that happens i mean you don't have a job i guess i'm just saying you know like that those are kind of things but that's great actually from overall you could see the impact and uh, you know uh, reduction in volume how what it can do to your roads i guess from uh, occupancy and overall uh, speeds and those things yeah. Yeah, normally, you know, I found that the number of incidents reported are similar to the amount of traffic that's out there. They see that drop. But Patrick, Karen G, any sort of new sort of changes or requests that popped up because of COVID and this experience? You have to see Montreal, uh, the request is sort of changing because in, for, like uh, probably everyone, the, uh, the traffic reduced it a lot. So. But there will be an, an increase more um, for the pedestrian and cyclist um, issues we had to address before. So I would say there more been a change. Uh, the city also adopted a uh, um, call it the Vision Zero, which is a zero disease uh, uh, in this through the city. So I would say this year the static will be good for us because there is a, a, a big decrease of vehicle. But we still now need to uh, use that opportunity actually to secure uh, more 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 safety in the streets because now uh, at this moment uh, there's a lot more pedestrian so a lot more vulnerable people uh, going on the streets so when the vehicle would start going back uh, we need to be careful about this so that that's one of the, the biggest concerns we have right now and requests from the citizens yeah and karen yes. G, i think you showed that more people are requesting your information than ever before. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, like uh, even uh, for like a public, like uh, we receive less complaints regarding like uh, signal timing or any traffic operation related, but uh, we were getting more requests from media regarding traffic volume too. They were more interested how many like uh, on each long weekend uh, drivers from lower mainland to drive uh, to the interior or like from drive uh, from bc to alberta or alberta to bc or to border crossing yeah cool another question that came from the the audience there was from a tmc perspective are operators assisting with providing additional service related to covid such as monitoring traffic around healthcare facilities and other items of those things you know crossed your lens uh, for sure, we that, like I said in the presentation, uh, we'll, since we also part of the emergency uh, team, uh, it was part of the, our, our extra work to do. But I think, yeah, there were a lot of more work to do on regards of um, reacting to that situation more than just the mobility. So yes, there was an increase on that side. But the uh, the, the guy, the team was uh, ready, and they were very good for that. Anyone else? Uh, uh, not much here from, uh, I mean, I, I remember there were a few requests. There were a huge lineup uh, where there was a tasting center, you know, uh, and then, yeah, we had to look at the, some, uh, you know, signal adjustment and those things that I vaguely remember. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, there was enough capacity from Calgary point of view. Uh, again, it may be different for other uh, cities, but uh, I think it kind of created a lot of capacity. I was on the road, I guess kind of uh, you know kind of have sorrow i would say yeah okay and karamji any sort of new things new requests that are coming in due to covid no no not from any emergency services yeah okay so you know i, I 
feel free to send in more questions that you may have. But one of the key sort of questions that I would, you know, love to pose to each one of you um, while we wait for maybe more questions to come in and be able to answer those and stay on a little bit longer if people so choose. Um, you know, as you guys are moving, as we're moving forward into, you know, this new reality, uh, moving into this near future, what are some key things top of mind that you're focusing on um, to support, you know, your ongoing service delivery? So I can speak like a, so yeah. like a, over here, the biggest challenge for us was uh, not have a real time data. So uh, for like our contractor was extracting data from our loops or, and then uh, it was delayed for a week. And then we were uh, analyzing that data and providing a report to our objective or to media or to uh, uh bc center for control disease and then we had like a, uh one full-time employee was uh, doing the data crunching and reporting and uh, processing so that's the biggest challenge and then what we came up with and that there was a gaps in data like uh, on some sites we we don't have available 2019 data for comparison and on some like uh, if you have a loop uh, broken loop or anything like you missed full week data then you don't uh, there is you no know, comparison to report that and so from that lesson learned we like in our ministry like now we, we created a internal committee that is looking after to how we can fill up these gaps and then how we can look at uh, to report a, any uh, desktop uh, dashboard kind and then uh, have that data and then don't need to process it automatically generate in graphs or like uh, so we can present uh, on real time based data to objective or to our media or stakeholders yeah so a lot of uh getting that data pipeline going and data governance management to the insights for those decisions patrick yeah. and samir marriage of me Okay, well, uh, for the Montreal, I would say um, all the technology is always a challenge and you have to be you know, up to date and ready to, and collecting data is one big issue, which is, um, I think, even before now and in the future, we always need to get better on that side. But I think during the, the pandemic, it's the biggest concern we have or challenges is about more about the human side. Um, all the team members, you know, they were working from their home but you know they had also the issue with uh, keeping safe their own family so at the same time so i think it's more about the that human side how we could still be you know operational and focus i, I don't say that it's we're critical because you know the see people in the hospital they they were a lot more harder but you know you still need to keep you know the, the frontline team uh operational and, and be able to go through that that, that situation uh, for us, uh, I, as I mentioned, we created this 40-40-20 uh, uh, split and uh, some technical uh, uh, technology adjustment or adaptation, right? It's kind of a, if we wonder it stays at another six months to a year, uh, we have that uh, capacity we can manage uh, uh, accordingly and those things. So uh, during the COVID time, I would say there were no services that uh, we did not provide actually we were doing before. So that's one of the things we kind of focused on. We kind of uh, listed actually what are essential things. We definitely have a, if we get a COVID case and we have to quarantine, so what's our strategy? So we, we're gonna, we have created these uh, high level, what are the essential uh, services we will provide during those situations? But uh, the current, luckily we don't have those cases. So, so far good. Again, Alberta is uh, highly, <laughs> these numbers are very high right now. Uh, we got some new restriction yesterday, so yeah, it's uh, things are changing so fast, I guess, you know, um, but we are keeping eye on monitoring those things. Thank you. So uh, just to clarify with the three of you, are you okay with staying on a little bit longer? We've got some more questions coming in. Able to stay on for another 10 minutes or 10, 15 minutes there? Okay, great, thank you. So Greg uh, Blatz out of Winnipeg uh, with the Transportation Management Center there said, um, since uh you know comparing previous requests they've had a 50 percent drop in the number of uh, requests come in from citizen concerns submitted so far um so maybe they're doing an awesome job and that's the reason um 
obviously that's part of it, but you know, that is one of those items there. But Greg asks um, for Patrick, when you were implementing the active and safe lanes, were there any issues with heavy right or left turn volumes across the lanes or turn restrictions implemented, special intersection treatments? Well, definitely, uh, we had to, you know, uh, reprogram most of the traffic like they were, you know, crossing the, those, those two lanes for sure. So, yeah, we had to reprogram. This was part of the planning, the urban planning. So, uh, any uh, roads were actually we used to create those uh, safe lanes. Um, basically, we need to, we had to rethink also uh, the whole, you know, program, uh, programming of, of, the, of the equipments. Uh, there were definitely uh, a lot, there were some streets that were basically just closed so uh, all of them also maybe, maybe what's easier to close we just restrict some street because um and but yeah at the same time since there were a lot decrease of the vehicle um and most of our uh, tra traffic lights as a pedestrian cross uh, line so the people they just use it so they were just getting more time just by using the those technology and some of the traffic lights may basically just still work uh, normally, uh, just by uh, using the, the prediction cross. Excellent. Just one quick question for you. I know that you have, you know, close to 80% coverage of your arterials with your cameras. Winnipeg has 60. You showed eco counter for some of the count data. Were you using the video cameras to count some of those movement activities as well to augment that? It was a mix of different technology. Uh, there are some material for the pre studies. Uh, because at the same time we were deploying different detectors uh, to be able to you know have live counts instead of uh, using the cameras. But uh, we actually manually do some count by using the camera feeds. But after the technology was in place, uh, we were able to get live data from those uh, lane traffic lanes. So, given the increased demand for this real-time traffic data that's you know come with COVID and people. You know, you see it in the news. We want to know what the counts are. We want to know what's going on with COVID and have that real-time information. Likewise, you know, that's, there's a growing demand for the, the mobility information that many of you are capturing. Um, you know, as you work through those capabilities to get that in BC and have that more apparent to yourself and more readily available, is there an interest in to making that more available to the general public, to senior management, so more so than what they currently have? Well, the city adopted the uh, uh, open data policy uh, maybe uh, six or seven years ago. So every every data we create or collect it has to be eventually, you know, available on that portal. Uh, there's still some work to, you know, define because just creating that portal and having all the, the quantity of data available, which is a huge, huge quantity, uh, it's a big challenge. But it's in going, it's ongoing, and probably I would say maybe now we have 30% of the city's data that's available, but more and more we increasing by uh, every time we update the system, we make it sure it is, uh, the data is available actually. So uh, same thing, Jonathan, in the city of Calgary, uh, that we have open source data the last few years, we've been populating as uh, it's growing. Uh, data may not be uh, readily available, as uh, you say, but then th there, is, there are technologies that are making it possible right now, I would say, uh, for sure that can be the next thing, you know, uh, having it uh, available in real time or more or less real time, I would say. Uh, for public in future, for sure. Yeah, but uh, yeah, we are going towards it for sure. And Karamji? Oh, just mute it. Oh, yeah, same. We have a traffic data program website, and then uh, we post all the data, traffic data throughout our provincial highways on that website. And uh, but uh, that data, we quarterly update that website. So it's like uh, maybe three months gap, and you can't see like. Uh, uh, real-time data but yeah we are looking like uh, if uh, in few the future new technology or what outcome from that working group and then definitely we will put that real-time uh, data for public and uh, our stakeholder okay so you know with this COVID situation going on have you seen uh, you know has this resulted in closer coordination and collaboration with surrounding cities and municipalities is something that you're doing kind of closed off or is this kind of a conversation that we're having right now not something that you commonly have uh, go ahead patrick, go ahead, patrick. yeah 
Oh, well, I'm, I'm not sure uh, the, about how is the future of the COVID. I'm saying I'm just uh, maybe Maria understood the question. Just, to, you know, with COVID, is this resulting in closer coordination and collaboration with other cities and municipalities? Oh, well, yeah, for sure. But in every emergency, I think every time there's a big emergency, we're getting closer to each other. That's uh, it's sort of part of the, every time we, we um, we improve our way of talking together, the more we improve the tools to get together. I think of it since it's a very long term uh, situation. Uh, I guess that that situation will increase uh, in, in different um, sphere of the uh, of the collaboration uh, process. So uh, I would say um, a lot of city around are well, you know, the city itself is, is is working by itself. But since we have also the um, I would say the security, uh, it's health security uh, commission that also uh, sort of regroup everyone together in the emergency. This also is, I think, is, helps a lot, you know, to link everyone together. But at the same time, as an operation uh, perspective, uh, we also you know working a lot to uh, link better. Since we're talking about virtualizing our, our management center and everything, uh, those situation helps a lot to um, increase the interest on the uh, other agency or stakeholder, stakeholder to you know be able to connect and share the information. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, there's two two agencies uh, in this moment that are actually we're working an agreement to make sure you know have a better uh, collaboration and uh, working together. So I would say the, the emergency helped to you know, create those links, will make it them uh, more uh, solid. Okay, Samir, Karanji. So uh, for the Calgary, as I mentioned, like a little bit different. I mean, like we don't have a lot of uh, municipality next to our, you know, in our neighboring uh, area and those things but we do have a lot of collaboration with Albert Transportation we run our TMC as a re R RTMC and those things uh, but the biggest thing I would say is um, not just outside but also internally I would say that is the biggest thing as you can you work with the cities like you can see a lot of uh, uh, different groups or uh, you know departments but I could see a lot of uh, departments coming working together as I, as a Patrick mentioned, some of the data sharing and those things, I guess those things are happening more often. You know, uh, that's with the COVID and uh, you know response point of view and those things. So yeah, there is a. I would say that that's kind of the changes I could see it uh, going on. I would say. All right, Karanjit, anything to add there? Yeah, like uh, for ministry, like uh, most like uh, in Metro Vancouver, all uh, the municipalities, we were sharing data with the, if any municipality was requesting data, we were sending to them and then if we need data close to our highway or, and we were, uh, we requested from municipality, they share data, but uh, uh, the major, uh, like uh, uh, the TransLink, uh, and then uh, they have like a couple bridge crossing and then they were sharing data with us and we were sharing with them. And uh, yeah, so it was, uh, we had very good relationship with the municipalities and then with the TransLink to regarding to share data with each other. Well, yeah, there's still some questions coming in here, but you know, I, due to time, you know, I just wanted to ask one final question. So, you know, as a community, it's made up of, you know, people within the public item, both provincially, municipalities, you have consultants and advisory, you've got vendors and distributors this all makes up that larger ITS sort of community um, from that perspective you know as a community how best can we support you during this time in in the services that you're delivering you know is there anything there that comes to mind well uh, I would say one if yeah, go ahead. The, uh, with this situation thank you summer uh, I would say uh, guys Think connected, think shared, think and start our solution. If I'm doing that, we'll be able to connect with each other because now we're going to a numeric era known. So we need to be able to connect with different system and, and tools and everything. Everything needs to be connected. So okay. same thing, uh, what uh, Patrick said, like, you know, learn from each other, I guess, you know, as uh, our systems are different, of course, you know, but uh, some of these things are so challenging right now. So definitely who knows what is our next, uh, you know, in our future, but uh, let's, uh, 
I think ITS Canada is being, you know, these webinars and uh, panel discussions, those are great to understand some of the action or uh, projects or uh, things that we're doing to, you know, mitigate those things. But uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's what I would say, yeah. Right. And Karen G. Yeah, well, we like uh, same as I said, like uh, there was a data gap and then we have a working committee and then uh, we are looking uh, for different uh, technology and uh, see how we can collect the real time uh, traffic data. And uh, so that's and then also uh, for ITS operation, we have same funding as last year and then uh, in this year and then uh, so we would have like uh, another future uh, a pilot project for ITS related, so it would have been same. Yeah, sounds good. So, kind of the key theme is obviously we're all in this together, but there's you know, if you want to go fast, go alone, if you want to go better, you know, go better. Um, and yet, and you know, we all are dealing with the same thing, regardless of how big our these jurisdictions might be. And so that creates an opportunity to have that synergy and work together. So, you know, on behalf of ITS Canada and the Advanced Traffic Management System Technical Committee, along with Amir, thank you for joining us. Um, thank you very much for, you know, spending this time and creating these presentations to illustrate what's been going on. Uh, we wish you all the best as you move forward and serve the various um, citizens that you're, you know, responsible for providing that transportation perspective. Um, for everyone else still on the call, you know, there's some upcoming events here. Uh, one of those items beyond data is just the skills and the capabilities needed to opportunities. Um, so there's a round table on that, you know, from the Ontario Center of Excellence kind of brought in. I had a chance to talk to Mona uh, and Kat, and it's a great group of people doing some really important things. And as well, we have our bi-monthly meeting coming up December 10th. Feel free to message Yannicka if you haven't participated before and would like to. And otherwise, check out the website. You can find the details there too. So thank you very much to our presenters once again. And thank you all for joining us and wish you all the best. Um, and take care and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.